Hello and uh, welcome back to my channel. Sorry, there was a bit of delay in uploading this video. Uh, my name is Felice Darko. I work in Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London, UK. Uh, and uh, this is um, a lecture that uh, I just did in the 6th Annual uh, American Society of Pediatric Neuroradiology Scientific Meeting in San Diego. Uh, it was a beautiful session with um, um, was a shared session with um, ESNR, European Society of Neuroradiology, and also uh, Latin American Society of Neuroradiology, LASPEN. Um, so consider to join this beautiful society, uh, societies. I'm a proud member of the American and European Society, and they do great meetings, great educational materials. You can find a lot uh, on their website. So consider joining. Um, while I put down my camera uh, so you can focus on the slides. This is really a nice topic. Cancer predisposition syndrome in general are very important for our radiologists. I will um, focus on the one that have implication for uh, head and neck and brain as well. Um, but I want to focus in particular uh, to pattern recognition. So how you can put together different pieces uh, uh, of a complex puzzle, a puzzle made by uh, abnormalities in uh, several uh, organ systems uh, and do your diagnosis. Right, so let me start with the, um, what syndrome means to the radiologist. First of all, uh, as I say, you need to connect the dot between different image findings, but also um, uh, clinical uh, findings. So you need a familiar history, uh, and also you need to be familiar with the uh, body abnormalities, not only neuro. And at least for me, this is very challenging. Second, remember that cancer predisposition syndrome are relatively frequent in children. So you need to keep this on the back of your mind when you see a tumor in, in um, uh, a child. And even more interestingly, even if you are not dealing with the uh, cancer predisposition syndrome per se, um, you need to keep in mind that no male uh, environmental causes are proven to be involved in pediatric malignancies. In other words, genetics and molecular pathways are always part of the cancer predisposition syndromes in um, uh, children. And you need to keep this in mind because, uh, as you know, and there is another lecture on uh, um, uh, pediatric brain tumor in my channel, um, you have a lot of different genetic um, and, and uh, molecular pathways involved in different tumors that explain the embryological origin of the tumoral cells and their location um, uh, in, uh, in the brain that helps you in turn in the differential diagnosis. So all these things you need to keep in mind. Uh, these are beautiful papers that I use, especially this one in Nature is a clinical paper, uh, but uh, um, by Professor Kratz is really, really uh, helpful. And just to remind you that uh, one out of 10 child, uh, children with, with um, uh, a tumor uh, has a cancer predisposition syndrome. I want to start with a half joke, but it's uh, just a half joke, not a full joke, because it's really something that uh, point out what I think is the essence of being a clinical radiologist. Let me show you a very famous picture. This is uh, Mick Jagger in Paris in a party uh, in 1967. So he was very famous. He was a rock star uh, and he was in a very cool city. Uh, Paris in the 60s was something, right? Not only that, this is one piece of, uh, of the bigger picture. Let's add some pieces to that. She was dating Marianne Faithful, smart, beautiful um, um, artist, uh, again, in Paris, in uh, a party in 67. We have a lot of information. But now the problem for the radiologist arises when you have two pieces of a bigger picture is that if this is Mick Jagger, very famous in Paris, in a party in the um, 60s, dating Marianne Faithful, why on earth is not smiling? There is something off that is not present in this picture. I will give you the, uh, the, the, the final bigger picture at the end of this lecture, but just to um, remind you that when you see 
uh, some combination of image findings or constellations of image findings, and they do not add up together, think out of the box. And in these specific cases, when there is a tumor plus something else, or more than one tumor, things cancer predisposition thing, syndrome. So it's all about connecting the dot, and you need to connect the dots even if uh, they are far, far away. This is a case-based presentation, so I start with the first case, which is this one. Clear old male, fell down three days ago from the stairs, so a traumatic history, and now he has reduced and move, movement. There is also a familiar history of risk of cancer, but the neurologist asked for the MRI spine because they imagined there was some sort of traumatic injury. Now, this is what the spine looks like. It was completely normal. But again, you must keep looking. And if you keep looking, something in the pons is abnormal. Now, if you have listened to the posterior fossa tumor lectures in my channel, you will know that uh, whilst posterior part of brainstem uh, is associated with benign tumors, uh, benign astrocytoma, when astrocytomas or uh, um, glioneuronal tumors, and they are often esophytic, when the anterior part of the pons is involved, the most likely diagnosis is a DIPG, or rather a pontine diffuse midline uh, glioma. However, we know that uh, uh, these uh, uh, diffuse um, uh, midline gliomas are characterized by a specific histone mutation, okay? So we look at something like that, we say, okay, the spine is normal, but the child has a tumor. But remember the familiar history of cancer. So we do the brain, and of course, this looks like the IPG, a bit more aggressive than usual, but then the bi biopsy reveals that the histone mutation is negative, and IDH is also negative. However, this child has TP53 uh, and MIC alteration. So something is uh, unexpected. Something is uh, uh, doesn't really add up to what you, you know, would have expected in these cases. So you need to keep looking because something is off. And in fact, you must um, keep looking. And the sister has multiple rhabdomyosarcomas in the head and neck region that I'm quite familiar with, but also in the legs. And this is very important because sarcomas are one of the most important tumors in a specific cancer predisposition syndrome, which is Lifraumeni, which explains why this pontine glioma is not the typical DIPG or pontine DMG because does not have this tone mutation. We cannot treat it in a different way, but in the future, these molecular differences may have a lot of uh, um, uh, impact in the, in the treatment, okay? So what is Lifraumeni syndrome? First of all, there are five types of cancer. Uh, brain tumors, and I show you, Adenocortical carcinoma, breast osteoarthritis coma, but soft tissue sarcomas are so important and they can be everywhere in the body. This is another patient with live from any at Gosh. Look at the foot with this sarcoma. And they are so important that they are part of the clinical criteria for diagnosis of Lifraumeni that were Lifraumeni that were established before they found out the mutation uh, in P53. So remember the importance of sarcomas and remember to look at the brain for tumors that may have a different molecular profile. Rhabdomyosarcoma are the most common lymphomania syndrome associated cancer in children. It is very, very important. Again, you keep looking at uh, 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 when even when you have a, a genetic diagnosis, you are not completely satisfied. And what is important is in case of rhabdomyosarcomas, in particular paramenyngeal rhabdomyosarcomas, very close to the skull base, that you look for infiltration along the cranial nerves and extension in particular along the trigeminal branches. It's a direct extension, different from this skip metastasis uh, of the eye um, um, uh, waste carcinomas of the adult, uh, but they cause problem to the um, ENT surgeons and impact the progression-free survival, and we published about that. Case two, uh, neonate with a mass in the right cheek. I've shown these cases, it's very, very important case uh, uh, that I found in my clinical activity I've shown in previous uh, uh, lecture. Look at this mass. Very aggressive looking. Restriction diffusion means 
um, uh, high cellularity and there are nodal metastases. But you must keep looking. If you look at this child, it also has a mass in the supravermian cistern. No enhancement, but striking diffusion restriction by way of reduction of the of reduction of ADC values here. So you have something that show restriction, but not enhancement. If you are an adult neuroradiologist, you will know that aggressive tumor often present with uh, enhancement. But in children, it's not like that. And a lot of embryonal tumors may do not have enhancement. This is important not only for the diagnosis. Look how striking and homogeneous is the low uh, the, the ADC um, um, reduction in this case, uh, but also is important for the follow-up because if you are looking for recurrence and metastatic disease, you basically only have the diffusion for small metastatic nodules. So that's very important, but this is in a child, is an embryonal tumor. And if you Google again, aggressive um, um, soft tissue tumors, this looks like a malignant rhabdoid tumor, an embryonal tumor, you will have only one specific or a couple of specific mutation. So this is what I told you, non-enhancing, well-defined bad diffusion restriction means bad. And this was an ATRT in association with synchronous orbital rhabdoid tumor due to SMARC B1 mutation. And if you um, remember, this is my pearl. I stressed already this concept. Low IDC means very cellular, no matter the contrast. But if you look at the literature, you know that uh, rhabdoid tumors may occur synchronously, and you need to think SMARC B1 or B4 mutation. And in fact, looking at this uh, paper from Nature, beautiful paper I highlighted here in yellow, SMARC B1 and B4 are typical mutation for rhabdoid tumors. Another teaching point that I have highlighted here in yellow is that the presence of bilateral synchronous or metachronous neoplasm is indicative of an underlying genetic disorder. The lesson to I learn is that a child is not a small adult. If you have leukocoria, typical sign of something wrong in the eyes of a child, you have a bunch of differential diagnosis. That's an amazing paper from Professor Kelly Robson in Boston Children, but the main differential diagnosis is a retinoblastoma. Now, is this important for you to do the diagnosis? Well, it is, but actually, Normally, these patients will come already with a diagnosis done by the ophthalmologist. What is important, though, is that you give to the oncologist all the information they want. And what are the information? Since the diagnosis is easy, to evaluate the extension along the nerve or somewhere else in the uh, central nervous system is very tricky. So Mick Jagger here. Uh, reminds us that while diagnosis is easy, extension is tricky when it comes to a retinoblastoma and you need to do the right um, uh, protocol. So the right protocol means that, meaning that this is a different protocol in comparison to, no, to standard orbital protocol that we do for infection, inflammation or other tumors and includes high resolution uh, 3D um, steady state heavily to weighted sequences, parasagittal post contrast uh, sequences along the course of the nerve, yeah, to look at the nerve invasion, but also you need to look at the brain invasion. So you can have brain imaging here showing the trilateral retinoblastoma and the spine, in case you have suspected the uh, invasion of the brain, you need to scan also the spine because the amount of chemotherapy and the, the, the therapeutic management of the, ch the child changes a lot. You should also use an SWI to confirm calcification that as shown in the previous table um, from Kelly Robson paper is an important element for differential diagnosis. So do brain imaging, do spine imaging, do the right protocol of the orbits. You cannot do too many sequences, you need to do the right sequences, of course, it's a balance of time and results. But in this case, you need to uh, give all the information you can to the clinician. It's also very, very uh, important that you keep in mind that the, the pineal gland, that is the favorite uh, uh, brain location of the retinoblastoma, 
is physiologically enhancing. And when the lesion is more than one centimeter, can be very diff and regular, can be very difficult to distinguish the normal pineal gland from an, uh, um, an aggressive retinoblastoma. Sometimes the only thing you can do is to do a follow-up, okay? And this is the protocol in retinoblastoma. We put several uh, sequences, including a high-resolution T2 in the midline for suspected pineal embryonal tumor when the, the size is less than one centimeter. And this we publish uh, one year and a half ago in guidelines for head and neck uh, protocol in children. There is another lecture only on this topic, but it's very important. Standardization is a very, very important topic. This was endorsed by several international uh, society. I'm very grateful for all people, to all the people that helped us uh, in this um, so um, paper. So uh, have a look, uh, uh, please, and do the right protocol. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, lesson three. You need to be aware of the meat mimics. Look at this case. This is a case for a uh, year old female with developmental delay, scoliosis, motor problem, and skin spot. Initially reported normal, but then we had another look. And actually, because as Mick Jagger told us, you need to keep uh, looking. Look at this thickening of the nerves. These are the V2, this is V3. You know, the V3 again, so the, the trigeminal branches are thicker. So you have skin spots, scoliosis, and thickening of the nerves. So we thought, okay, this must be neurofibromatosis type 1. We know that they present with scoliosis. We know that they present with plexiform neurofibroma. And we know that this is another cancer predisposition syndrome. However, look at this. This is smooth, enlarged nerves. There was no plexiform neurofibroma anywhere else. So again, there's something off in this case. If this is an NF1 also, where are the brain changes in the NF1? Again, Mick Jagger is smarter than us and tell us, uh, well, NF1 without brain changes whatsoever possible, but more in adults than in children. So maybe we need to keep looking. And this is... Uh, the, these are the appearances of the spine. So we scanned the spine and we saw that this uh, nerve enlargement uh, didn't come together, were not plexiform whatsoever, it didn't look like NF1. So if you have seen enough NF1, you will recognize instinctively the differences between a plexiform neurofibroma and diffuse but homogeneous enlargement of the nerves. There is scoliosis, it was operated, but this is not a cancer predisposition syndrome. This is a charcot marito type 1A due to this specific gene called PMP22 mutation. So what I learned, first of all, both charcot marito and neurofibromatosis can present with um, scoliosis and with enlargement of the nerves. But there are some differences. Charcot marito is a group of disorders that cause damage in the peripheral nerve with muscle weakness, that is the main symptom, and causes then scoliosis. And the main radiological finding is this homogeneous hypertrophic demarination of the nerves. You can have white matter lesion, but they are different from NF1. NF1 is a cancer predisposition syndrome. We know it's due to neurofibromin 1. There are other associated manifestations, cafe or late spot, leash nodule, optic pathoglioma, astrocytoma, fuzzy, vasculopathy. But remember, plexiform neurofibroma, they look like that or like this. So these nerves come together, they are very bulky. They are not, uh, the anatomy is not respected as in sarcoma marito. And there is scoliosis, which is not only due to plexiform neurofibroma, but near, uh, NF1 is also a primary bony dysplasia. So NF1 in the spine, remember, spinal deformity is usually in the thoracic region. Sometimes you can have deformity in the cervical spine in NF1, but there has been little attention in literature, which is very worrying because you can have cervical deformity and you can have severe core deficit. And look at this case. This is a case which presented with expected NF1 brain changes, but the radiologist uh, described this, this, uh, um, this plastic appearance of the odontoid process. However, nothing was done 
and this presented like that over time. So remember something, this is very important. The causes of scoliosis are not only neurofibromas, but also primary dysplasia, androgen abnormality, osteomalacia. I put a couple of papers here, please download them, read them, because this is very important. Again, I try to focus on things that are um, able to impact the patient management. So you need to keep these things in mind. Okay. So remember NF1 is a cancer-based position syndrome, but also disease of the bones, okay? Pattern recognition, rapid fire cases for you. First, you have thyroid tumor in a young patient. It's already something off. Hmm? And then you have a pulmonary, pulmonary blastoma. If you are not a body radiologist, a pulmonary blastoma presented like the cystic tumors in the lung of the child. Now you can already use Google, but because you are, um, uh, you like head and neck, you keep looking at the head and neck areas and you can have nasal chondromas and chemal hamartoma. They are espantile homogeneous nasal mass. They can have some calcium inside, very typical association from Dicer 1 syndrome, which is another cancer predisposition syndrome. What I didn't know when I start studying for this presentation is that Dyser 1 can also present like that with mass in the, in the uh, neck region. So when I saw something like that, I call it a rhabdomyosarcoma. And I was very surprised. Of course, the age is not good because this child was very young. But anyway, I was very surprised when it came out as a teratoma. And then I start studying and I realize that the Teratoma in the context of Dyson 1 mutation are different from what we expect normally in terms of histology and probably molecular profile. So I found this paper. The teratoma like feature are associated with the rhabdomyosarcomatous element and also elements that resemble the embryonal tumor with multilayer rosettes that are normally embryonal tumor that we find in the brain. So this is very, very important guys, uh, that uh, maybe this look like rhabdomyosarcoma because part of the histology looks like rhabdomyosarcoma as well. Maybe difficult to do this diagnosis on the spot, but at least you need to be aware of these differences and uh, maybe this can impact the treatment. Um, especially cancer predisposition syndrome when we really we know very little and uh, we uh, we, we have an expansion of the knowledge by the day. Another case, multiple basal cell carcinoma plus palmar pitting. Palmar pitting is extremely useful clinical information. If you put together with odontogenic keratocyst and ophthalmological abnormalities, strabismus, cataract, and blindness, there is only one possible diagnosis, Gorlin syndrome. If you Google Gorlin syndrome, the PTC H1 and 2 are the main genes that come up. But you must keep looking. And uh, in this case, you can have brain tumor and Falk's calcification. The brain tumor will be a specific kind of medulloblastoma, a sonic HH, um, uh, sonic hedgehog, so SHH activated medulloblastoma. But uh, children with a medulloblastoma uh, statistically will have more likely a third mutation that is a SUFU1 mutation which is important to know because, of course, if you have uh, the other way around, odontogenic uh, keratosis, palmar pitting, and uh, the child came out with a Gorlin syndrome due to SUFU1 mutation, you need to look and to follow up very closely the brain. And these are some interesting uh, uh, papers. Uh, in theory, if you see a sonic hedgehog looking like medulloblastoma, remember that they look in a very typical fashion with this, either with this nodularity and or with peripheral location, plus very early calcification of the FALX, you can do a possible diagnosis of Gorlin syndrome. So think out of the box, calcification of the FALX are very rare in young children, do not dismiss as a weird finding, especially in the context of medulloblastoma. And remember medulloblastoma because they are um, the SSH medulloblastoma, sonic hedgehog, because they are cells from the granular cell um, uh, layer uh, stuck on the surface of the, the cerebellum, they almost look 
um, uh, extra axial, very peripheral in location. So again, there is another lecture on this topic, but please remember that you can do a diagnosis of, um, uh, of SHH medulloblastoma if you see a restricting mass very peripherally in the cerebellum. And if there are this nodularity, it's very, very easy. Finally, a case of masses that are restricting in the basal, uh, in the skull base and in the vertex. There is also an associated weird location of this uh, aggressive process in the eye. But most importantly, in this case, we do ultrasound of abdomen because we think metastatic neuroblastoma. Multiple restricting masses in the skull base and skull vault are typical of metastatic neuroblastoma. So you need to do an ultrasound of the abdomen. Fine. This was the result. We are fine. But what if I tell you that this child has a sibling with a lesion like that? When I saw the first time they sent me from another hospital, it was humiliating because I told them it's following the lymph node chain has to be a lymphoma. But this is also where you know the, the, the parasympathetic chain is. And this location in these spaces going into the neck, especially if the mass is homogeneous, there is nothing else, is typical of ganglioneuroma. It is another neuroblastic tumor. And remember, neuroblastic tumor can also have a predisposition syndrome due to ARC mutation, is autosomal dominant, and is specific to neuroblastic tumor. These are some paper. So when you see multiple neuroblastic tumor, or when you see two siblings with uh, uh, neuroblastoma and a ganglioneuroma, uh, or a combination of these, think ALK mutation, okay? So let me back uh, go back to this uh, famous uh, picture. We have Mick Jagger at the Kuhlman of his uh, um, career in Paris, cool city, cool party, 1967, Dating Marianne Faithful, why on earth he is not smiling? Because this is Mick Jagger in Paris dating Marianne Faithful, but Alain Delon is in the room. So if something is off in your radiological assessment of a child, think out of the box. And if you are dealing with tumor, think cancer predisposition syndrome. These are my acknowledgement, but I have two bonus cases that I didn't show in um, San Diego because this was focused on head and neck, but I want to show you now. And uh, the first case is an 80 year old boy admitted with acute neurological symptoms at GOSH, aggressive tumor, a lot of edema, necrosis, restriction. This looked like a, a high grade glioma. Fine, so this is what I diagnosed. However, I kept looking at the scan and there, were, there was an area of transmantal heterotopia and a tremendous amount of large DVAs. Look at this enormous DVA in the cerebellum. Look at this paramedian, the basal ganglia, other not shown here. Guys, if you have an aggressive or a glioma, or in general, a glioma, plus a lot of DVAs in the brain, there is one syndrome you want to consider, and this is the Constitutional Mismatch Repair Deficiency Syndrome. Beautiful paper um, from Zoltan Padain and Hen Hoffman. And they describe uh, mainly high-grade gliomas, sometimes other kind with additional non-neoplastic brain imaging, particularly developmental venous anomaly. And this is their paper. These are some of the aggressive tumor. These are the multiple DVAs. In my case, was striking, but that it, it allowed me to put uh, the, the, the um, uh, CMRDS in the report. So they checked for it, they had confirmation, the child um, do not miss any day for this diagnosis. And you know I'm very happy that I, I, I Google it and I found this association. But remember, don't dismiss DVAs in a context of an aggressive glioma in a child just because you are used to call them incidental. What about the heterotopia? Well, in, uh, we found uh, at least one case C is where this uh, uh, CMMRD um, were associated with the subependimal gray matter heterotopia. So probably malformation of the 
development of the, the cortical development can be associated as well. But our case report and this case series are the only two um, uh, associations reported um, to the best of my knowledge. Second case, remember guys, L2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria can be a cancer predisposition syndrome and is associated with IDH mutant glioma. But the most important, and these are again two um, papers from the great Zoltan Patai. We miss him very much. He was a brilliant neuroradiologist uh, and we need more people like him really. Um, but why is like that? Why L2 hydroxyglutaric acidura, which has all these demyelination changes, also has a predisposition to cancer? Look at the cycle here, the citric acid cycle. You have a situation like that with IDH can be mutant, and there is an accumulation on T2 hydroxyglutarate. However, you can have an accumulation of T2 hydroxyglutarate um, even if the, the production is normal, but you cannot destroy it, you cannot metabolize it because you are in the context of L2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria. So IDH mutation, gain of en enzyme function, overproduction of 2-HG, and then you can have a tumor for, like in adult. If you, have, if you have L2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria, the enzyme is not working, normal production of 2-hydroxyglutarate accumulated in the brain. So an excess of um, 2 hydroxyglutarate is both myelinotoxic, and you see this typical subcortical abnormalities in L2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria. They also have globipallidae abnormalities and so on, but also carcinogenic. So don't, uh, so look hard in these uh, patients for small areas of hyperintensity that have a bit of mass effect in the context of this uh, uh, demyelination disorder is very, very important. Uh, and sometimes can be tricky to identify them, follow them up, operate to be operated as soon as they show aggressive feature. Okay, I hope this uh, help. Uh, these are my acknowledgement, uh, and uh, um, please come back with any feedback if you uh, liked or not or didn't like this lecture.